All right, you can turn in your Bible this morning to Exodus chapter 32 and verse 14. I had a uh, brother email me and he said, what do you do with this verse? You know, I, this is a kind of a rough one. There's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that are kind of rough. Uh, it's been said and it's been very well said that the Bible is really not hard to understand. It's just oftentimes hard to believe, you know. Book of Revelation is actually a very easy book to understand. It's just there's a lot of stuff that the Bible says is going to happen which we can't imagine. And so because of that, we say it's hard to understand. But it's really not. You know, the Bible just says this is the way it is. It's our job to believe it. And we're going to be looking at some very hard sayings in Scripture today. This is a very difficult message to put together and I pray that I preach it correctly, but we're going to start out here in Exodus chapter 32, verse 14. Okay. It says here, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. And before we get started, I just want to quick open with prayer because, like I said, this is a tough one. So let's go to the Lord in prayer quick here. Heavenly Father, um, I know your word is perfect. I know your word is truth. And I just pray that uh, this morning we're going to be looking at some scriptures that most people try to stay away from. And I'm not going to it to be carnal or anything else. It's uh, I, These verses are very important to get to people. And I think that the time is coming very soon where a lot of these scriptures are going to be fulfilled that we're going to be looking at today. And uh, people need to understand that, yes, you are a God of love, but you also are a God that is just and righteous and holy and perfect and that hates sin. And uh, you judge sin, Lord, and that's what we're going to be talking about today in this sermon. So I pray that the people here, that they would that listen to this message, I pray that they would be, uh, that they would have ears to hear what I'm saying and that, that you would speak through me and, and have me not say anything that's contrary to your word. Uh, a lot of these things, like I said, are going to be hard for some Christians to accept, but your word teaches it, and I'm going to be hopefully proving it today. So I just uh, pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, two questions come up. Question number one, there from Exodus chapter 32, verse 14, does the Lord repent? Yes. Yes. And uh, the second question would be, does the Lord Himself bring evil upon people? What's the answer? Yes. Yes. Yes, He does. People say, oh, well, wait a second here. You know, Well, if He's repenting, then that means He's a sinner. No. you got to read the context. The word repent is not always tied to sin. Okay, the Bible says that Jesus Christ came to call sinners to repentance. Yeah. But what does the word repent mean? It's not always connected with sin. What it means is that you are turning from something. Okay, You're changing direction. Now, when you see it show up there with the Lord, that doesn't mean that He is a sinner and that He's having to, to repent of His sin. I mean, if, if that was true, who's, re, who's He going to repent to? <laughs> you know, Who's He going to confess His sins to? Obviously, it's not talking about that. What it's talking about here is that the Lord was going to judge these people. And we're going to see about this. We're going to read the verses. And he changed his mind. Now, why did he change his mind? We'll go to verse 7. Exodus chapter 32, verse 7. We're going to read the story here. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way, which I commanded them, they have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. God was going to wipe out the Jewish people. The Israelites. He was just saying, Moses, you know what? I'm going to kill every single one of these people and I'm going to start over again with you. Let's see what happens here. 
Verse 11, And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt, with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, also known as Jacob in your Bible, thy servants to whom thou swearest by thine own self and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of with of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Now, was God kind of foolish here, and Moses had to correct him, and God didn't know any better? No. God was putting Moses to the test. See, God will oftentimes do that. He'll see how much love you really have for people. And that's what he was doing here with Moses. He was testing Moses to see if Moses would say, yeah, fine, go ahead, kill him. I don't care. <laughs> you know, If he had done that, the Lord probably couldn't have used Moses. And it's kind of interesting because in the future, if you study this thing out, Moses comes back and deals with the same people as far as the same race of people, the Israelite people. And he comes back to a nation that's not worshiping God in spirit and truth. No, he comes back to a nation of lost people. If you go to Israel right now, there aren't that many saved Jewish people. And when Moses comes back, Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, and when they come back, they're dealing with a stiff-necked people again. And standing before, between them and God, and showing signs and wonders on the earth, to confirm the word, the New Testament, actually, <laughs> because the Jews don't accept it right now. So you're going to see this thing come back. And God right there is testing Moses to see how much he loves the Jewish people, the people that he's a part of. Okay, that's what this is, what's going on there. It's not that God was going to do this bad stuff and Moses stopped him from doing it. God's just testing him. Okay, but you see it right there. Now, would God have been justified in bringing that evil upon those people? Absolutely. Why? Because they were sinning. Instead of giving God the glory... I mean, this, this takes place after the crossing of the Red Sea. Think about that. That tremendous miracle and all the things, you know, seeing... The, the, the cloud, you know, the plagues of Egypt. Yeah, the plagues of Egypt. The whole Passover thing. You know, the type of the cross. I mean, you know, the put the blood on the two sides and on the top, you know. Kind of like the, the blood of a lamb. That whole, I mean, big study. After seeing all that, after seeing the, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, God's presence following with them, Crossing the Red Sea, God parts the sea, they walk across on dry land, He drowns the Egyptians. After seeing all of that, they go and they make a golden cow and they say, this is your God that brought you out of Egypt. How foolish. That was stupid of them. God would have been justified in bringing evil upon that people. Okay? It's right there. Now let's look at what happened here. Jump to uh, verse 26. You say, well, then God was just merciful and the people escaped judgment, right? Wrong. Verse 26, Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. So yeah, God did stay his judgment and his wrath from the Israelite people as far as he didn't wipe them all out, but they still were judged. And the ones who didn't come over to Moses, we skipped a lot of verses there, you can read them some other time, but he went down and he destroyed the, the molten calf there and everything, you know, and, and basically he said, 
who's on the Lord's side, let him come to me. And there were people that even after that, they stayed with that pagan idolatry. And they were the ones that were killed. And it was a justified thing. You know, it wasn't a bad thing that the Lord had done to those people there. It's kind of interesting too. I just want to make a note before we continue here. Uh, how many people died? 3,000. 3, you know what's kind of interesting? How many people got saved in Acts chapter 2? How many Jews got saved? 3,000 3, on the day of Pentecost. Hmm. Kind of interesting. The Lord uh, has mercy many times. Now we're going to go back to Genesis chapter 6. Go back even farther in time. God and repentance. We're going to look at some of these verses here. The thing about God repenting of evil that He was going to do to people. We're going to look at another type of repentance here. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. It says here, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Kind of like the average man, lost man or woman on the streets today. Verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So even in a time of God's wrath and judgment that's coming, there still is justice and righteousness. A good man, God's not going to punish him. Okay, If you're doing right, if you're saved, God's not going to punish you along with the wicked. He never has, and He never will. Why? Because He's a righteous God. He's a just God. He doesn't punish the righteous with the wicked. Okay, He will allow the, the righteous to be persecuted by the wicked, but when it comes to His own wrath being poured out, he will always spare the righteous from the wicked. Okay, from the person, from the wrath that comes on the wicked people. But uh, notice something else there. Um, verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. There are so many verses that you can use against Calvinism, it's just crazy. And right there's another one. See, Calvinism teaches that there are God's chosen, the elect, and then there are God's not chosen, the non-elect. Well, obviously, the people that were destroyed in the flood, they wouldn't have been God's elect. They would have been non-elect. You know, were supposedly chosen before the foundation of the world, right? So these people that were destroyed in the flood, obviously, they would have been non-elect. Why would it grieve the Lord at His heart then? If they're non-elect, why would He be grieved? See? No, man has a free will. Man is given the choice to choose between good and evil. And when man chooses evil, the Lord says, Boy, I'm sorry I even gave you life. I'm going to take it away now. I'm going to have to bring judgment on you to stop you from what you're doing. And I'll tell you right now, this has really been hitting me a lot recently. When you have, we'll say a dispensation, because that's a Bible word, Every dispensation ends in apostasy, ends in destruction. Every single one. And you get to a place where people cannot be turned around. They won't repent. You know, they won't turn from their evil. You get to a point where there's nothing left but God's judgment and God's wrath. And we are very close to that right now. The way people are so hard-hearted to the things of the Lord, the way people mock this King James Bible, you know, it's being fulfilled in the daily news every day. Every day. Earthquakes. Earth, there's lots of earthquakes. Famines. What about over in Africa right now? What about down in Texas? There's a drought that's going to lead to famine. Okay? Pestilence. There's a lot of disease. Wars and rumors of wars. I mean, it just, you can turn on the daily news and prove Bible prophecy being fulfilled. And yet people reject the book. Why? Because they're evil. And God's going to have to bring evil upon these people. Why? Because He's a just God. People want to think that God is only about love. That's not it. Okay. And, and by the way, judgment is love. 
true love. Okay? Um, continuing on here. And of course, what's the repentance there that God had in Genesis chapter 6? Was it because he was a sinner? No. It was repenting. He was sorry that he had made man. And he was saying, instead of my blessing these people and giving these people life and giving them food and giving them shelter and protecting them, I'm going to turn from that now and I'm going to bring a flood on them and destroy them. See, God had been blessing them and the blessings that God was giving to them, they were using to sin. Every imagination of their heart was only evil continually. You know, America is the most blessed nation in the world. What are the people doing with it? Say, well, we, you know, let's fight for the republic. Let's fight. Let's bring America back to a constitutional republic. Let's bring the economy back. Let's go back to the gold and silver standard. Let's destroy the Federal Reserve. And, let's say, and what are you going to do with it? Consume it upon our own lusts. Yeah, consume it upon their own lusts. Exactly. If God restored America, like a lot of the brethren are even saying, a lot of the Baptists especially, they'll, you know, America, let's fight for America and stuff. Why? What are you going to do with it? See? Even now when times are getting bad, men aren't repenting. They aren't turning to God. So why should God bless them? See? The Lord's going to have to bring evil. Okay. Turn to, we're going to go next to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 9. Now here you have a story about David numbering, numbering the Israelite people and God did not want him to do that. And this is what happens. As a result, okay, First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 9. It says here, And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus, thus saith the Lord, Choose thee, either three years famine, or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring thee again to him that sent me. Oh, what a cruel, terrible thing to do. Give him three choices. Three years of famine, people starving, or three months where the enemy is allowed to come in and attack the people. Be like the Lord saying, I'm going to give you three months of communist China coming in here and warring against the people. Instead of cars going by down there on the road, you hear tanks coming. You hear airplanes. You hear shooting. You hear artillery going off in the distance. That'd be bad. Or the Lord says, for three days I'll come through. Tough decision. <laughs> Very tough decision. Verse 13, And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. You're telling me. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. Good choice. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. Wow. 9-11 was what, 3,000 people killed on 9-11? And it was, you know, oh man, that's bad. Can you imagine 70,000? Wow. Verse 14, So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell on Israel... I already did read that one. Verse 15, um, And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it, and as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for, thy, as for these sheep, what have they done? 
Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. Now, if God brought judgment and wrath on America, do you think our politicians would do that? Do you think they'd be up there ripping their clothes and falling down their faces and saying, Oh God, please, you know, pour out your wrath on us. They wouldn't be doing it. Why did the Lord stop? Why did the Lord repent of the evil? Because He said that's enough. Okay? David was very smart for putting his judgment, the, the judgment, you know, picking the third one there, the third option where the Lord said, I'll go in and, and smite. Because the Lord has mercy. Men don't a lot of times. Okay? So you see another example there. But even in judgment, God is oftentimes still merciful. And, you know, God's not going to punish more than He should. He knows the limit there, you know, to which people should be punished. Okay. I was going to say, I didn't know if you are going to hit this, but with all three of those options, even though David chose one and, and the Lord kind of quit early, each one of those three options did have an end. So yeah. You, even though what happened happened, there was still mercy in every single one of those those judgments. Yeah, that's right a good up point. Front. So anyway, mm -hmm. yep. Um, we're going to look at a couple verses here. Uh, turn next to Isaiah chapter forty-five. Isaiah chapter forty-five, verse five. Here we're going to see something else that's very interesting. A lot of stuff that people uh, are going to avoid. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 5 says, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Even the atheist that claims that they don't know God, God still created him. He's still the God of the universe. doesn't matter what they think. Verse 6, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light. Now look at this. And create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now a lot of people are going to have a very hard time accepting that verse. And you know... It used to be people would say, boy, I just don't understand. I'm going to have to pray about that. Boy, I, I just, that's a, that's a hard saying, as the Bible says. But now what do people do? They'll run to the Hebrew and see if they can explain it away. And if they can't explain it away in the Hebrew, if the Hebrew text says that, then they say, well, maybe it was a scribal error. People are so quick to try and deny the book when they can't handle it. And that's the, the main reason, by the way, why you have these new versions, why there's so many attacks on the King James Bible. It's not because it's hard to understand. I just heard a thing from Sam Gipp. He went through the Bible and uh, looked at verses, whole verses that are made up of single-syllable words. And I think it was like over 190 verses in the King James Bible that are totally made up of single-syllable words. You know, it's, it's just amazing. This is not a hard book. To understand. It's a hard book to believe, as I said earlier. Is that hard to understand right there? I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. There's not one archaic word in that whole verse. Not one. Okay, and most of them are single-syllable words. Very easy to understand, but it's hard to believe for a lot of people. I want to read some verses here. We're not going to turn there for sake of time. I'm just going to zip through these things. But notice the distinction there. Light and darkness. Peace and evil. Notice the distinction. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 13 says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light. Or, but now... Okay, that thing's uh, misprint there. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So you see there, you were darkness, but now you're light. You're children of light as saved Christians. Verse 9, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, 
proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. So you see there, light equals peace. Darkness is evil. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 9 says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, day, there, of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. You say, wait a second, wait a second. That doesn't make sense. The day comes as a thief in the night. Well, sure. The day is associated with the Lord. The night is associated with evil in the world. So the Lord comes back for the children of light in the night. Now, of course, it's not going to be night for us all around the earth unless there's an eclipse, which is very possible. There's some you know, thoughts on that. There's this comet Elenin or something which is coming in and people don't know what it is and what's going to happen. And it's going to come this month, they say. And uh, it could cause an eclipse for three days, they're saying. And this is NASA saying this. This isn't conspiracyworld.com or something. I mean, this is NASA saying this. So it could be night all around the earth when the Lord comes. Possibility, I'm not sure. I'm not going to be dogmatic on it. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.3 For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Very interesting. Like I was saying earlier, I don't know how you can't see what's going on in this earth right now and be convinced that the Bible's true. But then, then again, I'm a child of the day. I'm not in darkness. See, the lost world right now that thinks everything's okay and, and it's getting bad, but it's, you know, it's going to go back to happy times again. What's going on? They're in darkness. They're sleeping. Spiritually, they're blind. They're dead in trespasses and sin. They are in evil, in darkness. That's what's going on there. A couple more verses here. John chapter 11, verses 9 and 10 says, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Saved versus lost. If you're walking right now in the day and you have the light of Jesus Christ within you, you understand what's going on. You know, I, I have fellowship with brethren all over the world and it's just like we think the same. Many of them, many times, you know, I just had a brother in, in the UK, a pastor over there, and I was listening to one of his sermons. I just met the guy. Just listening to one of his sermons and it's like exactly the things that I was preaching, almost the same sermon outline. And he recorded his before hearing of me and I recorded mine before hearing of him but what's going on we're children of the day the same spirit is within us exactly and it doesn't matter what race you are what what nation you're part of or whatever if you're saved you have that Holy Spirit in you the spirit of truth that leads into all truth first John 1 6 and 7 says if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. You see these people that say that they're Christians, and yet they have no idea what time it is right now. And you talk to them about the rapture, and they go, Oh, you know, I don't believe that's going to happen in my lifetime. You know, you're dealing, I think, there with a false convert. I remember I said the one time to a professing Christian, that the Antichrist is going to be showing up, and he laughed at me. Oh, ha, <laughs> you know, ha. <laughs> I thought, uh, are you that ignorant? You better get dark. Yeah. 
You know, it's incredible. What about eternity? You say, well, that's here in this life. What about eternity? Matthew 25, verse 30 says, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I've talked about this in other studies. I believe that hell, you see the pictures of orange flames and stuff like that and people in there, you know, the souls and things. That's not actually accurate. The Bible describes hell as fire and brimstone. Brimstone is sulfur. Bible word for sulfur. When you burn sulfur, it emits a like an invisible or a purple type of flame. So if hell is, the fires are lit by brimstone, by sulfur, you're going to basically have an invisible flame down there. So you're going to be burning in pitch black darkness. Well, that's going to be a good time. You know? Oh, why would a loving God create such a place? He created it for the devil and his angels. You don't have to go there. Okay? I mean, it's so ridiculous. I mean, it'd be like somebody saying, I, I have money problems, and I, I say, here, there's my wallet. Take it. It's free. Well, I just think it's so horrible that I have money problems. It's free. Take it. Yeah. Just come up and take it. Well, I just don't think it's right that I have money problems. That... Should I have mercy for somebody like that? No. It's a free gift. God says, salvation is free. Whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's free. Take it. You don't have to go to hell. Nobody has to go to hell. Anyhow, continuing. Revelation chapter 21. Let's look at one more uh, set of Scriptures here and then we'll get back turn other places here. Revelation 21 verses 23 through 25. Look at again the thing of light. Speaking of heaven... It says, in, "...and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there." I don't like night time. I never have. Some people like the night life. I hate it. <laughs> You know, I don't even like it when it's like this outside. You know, it's it's kind of dark and gloomy. It's going to rain today. I don't like that. I like it to be bright and sunny. I love bright and sunny days. You know, people get all upset when there's a drought. I don't. <laughs> you know, I wake up, yeah, blue skies again. You know, <laughs> I like the light. I always have. You know, the last week we didn't get to do the sermon because the hurricane knocked our power out and had trees all over the road. But that hurricane was at night. I didn't like that. I didn't enjoy that. I didn't enjoy laying in bed and hearing the sound of wind blowing and trees cracking and hitting the ground. I didn't like that. Gave me some time to fellowship with the Lord. <laughs> Had a lot of time to pray. But uh, I don't like nighttime. I never have. And I think partly it's because the Lord reveals in me you know, bears witness with my spirit that, hey, sometime when you get to eternity, there's never going to be any more night. It's never going to get dark again. Looking forward to that. Now, I kind of covered this a little bit before, but I want to just say this before we continue. Question, did God create hell? Yes, he created hell. It wasn't some place that he found and said, oh, that looks good. I'll send some people down there. No. He created hell. Matthew 25, 41, 41 says the reason why. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So why did God create hell? For the devil and his angels. For the devil and his angels. Yeah. If you go there, you're not supposed to be there. God didn't create it for his creation. Okay? Does God force anybody to choose evil? No. It's their right they can choose or reject. Turn to Amos chapter 3. One of the minor prophets. These are probably the most ignored books in the entire Bible. Amos chapter 3, verse 6. There's a lot of good stuff though here in the minor prophets. Here's another one that's going to be very tough for a lot of people. Okay, Amos, Amos chapter 3, verse 6. 
Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? Oh, evil in the city, and the Lord hath not done it? You mean the Lord causes evil in the city? Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 19 says, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter, that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. God allows sin to be there, to be created, and if people want it, He'll give it to them. And you'll see that throughout the Bible. There's you know stories we read, the, the uh, one sermon, I think it was the weird Old Testament stories, where it talks about a lying spirit coming, and God saying, He chooses him, and He says, go down there and get into the mouth of the prophets to deceive the people. Why would God do that? Because that's what the people wanted. And if you want evil, if you want wickedness, if you want sin, God will give it to you. He'll say, go ahead. You know? I have given you heaven, eternal life. It's right there. All you got to do is come and take it. And you don't want it. Okay. Then I'll give you evil. I'll give you drunkenness. I'll give you AIDS. I'll give you sin. I'll give you whatever you want. Go ahead. God allows that. Jump over to chapter 5, verse 4. Now this prophecy is, is to Israel, but... A lot of the Bible is, can be used for instruction in righteousness. Okay, and we're going to see here the last part of this message is going to be end times prophecies where God brings evil. Amos chapter 5, verse 4. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live, but seek not Bethel, nor enter into Gilgal, and pass not to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to naught. What's Bethel in the Old Testament? The house, of God. the house of God. Did you know that God told the Jews there in the Old Testament, don't go to church? And that was, by the way, when they had the temple. It wasn't the thing of a, like we have right now in the church age where the, the church is our body. It's a living group of believers. They actually had a building back then. And the Lord said, don't go down to that church over there. Why? It's going to come to nothing. And Jesus Christ, when He showed up, it was pretty much nothing. I mean, you had the leader of the synagogue and stuff, and the, and the men that were teaching in the synagogue, they were the ones that killed Jesus Christ. They were the ones that were casting Him out all the time. They were in there selling things and using it to, to rip people off. You know? And Jesus went in with a whip and drove them out. It came to nothing. And guess what? Most of the modern churches today are coming to nothing. They're filled with lost people. Lost preachers up in front lying to the people. It's coming to nothing. And I'll tell you something, and you get mad at me if you want to, seek not the churches today. we got to tell people that. Most of the churches are messed up. Most of them are so bad doctrinally, all they want you for is to pay their bills. The preacher wants to live above the level of doctors and lawyers. He wants to make a couple hundred thousand a year and live in a mansion someplace. And he'll have his public relations people deal with the, the people that pay his salary. Churches have become corporations. Don't go to them. I hate saying that. I mean, there are probably still some little churches out there. You know, I know down south there's some good Baptist churches and things. And I tell people, yeah, you know, go to them. If it's a good church, you got a good man there, King James Bible believer, singing the old hymns, you know, the, the old standards. Yeah, go to it. That's okay. But most of them, stay away from them. Okay? Just the way it is. Verse 6. Seek the Lord, and ye shall live, lest ye break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. Ye who turn judgment to wormwood, and leave off righteousness in the earth. Good description of the modern churches. Very good description. 
Uh, jump down to verse 10. You say, well, I, I don't appreciate what you're saying there. I, I don't think that's right. You're divisive. You're blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, here we go. Verse 10, they hate him that rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. Hmm. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 16 says, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? See the correlation there? Second Peter 2, 1 and 2 says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Oh, you're one of those King James only people. You're a fundamentalist. I got called a fundy. You know, people call me a retard. They call me, I had some guy call me the angel of light. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm Lucifer. Yeah, okay. You know, I get called all kinds of names. Why? Because I'm speaking the truth to people. The way of truth shall be evil spoken of. You know, this cult that we're part of here at Bible Believers Fellowship was mainstream Christianity 50, 60 years ago. Nobody would have disagreed with us. We were the church. You go back 100 years ago, there wouldn't have been one person that would have agreed with the modern churches. They were all using the King James Bible. They were all singing the old hymns. You go to any church, Presbyterian or, or Baptist or just independent Bible or evangelical free or whatever. Methodist, Methodist yeah. I won't say Lutheran because, you know, yeah. they're pretty much always been rotten. But you go to, to most of the churches back then, they would have been just like us. We could have fit in anywhere. We are not the cult. Okay? And you'll see that a lot of times. We are totally open-minded. We will take any literature. We'll show you why it's wrong. But these modern Christians, they are the ones that are narrow-minded. They are the ones that will refuse to listen to you. They are the cult. And you look at them, they'll follow the false prophets, the false teachers. And they'll submit to those guys. And they won't question. But continuing on here, another prophecy, one of the most amazing in the Bible. Uh, Amos chapter 8, verse 11. You're going to see here a very unique judgment that God brings. And this is very true for Israel, but it's also true for the entire world right now. Amos chapter 8, verse 11. It says here, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Wow. Isn't that something that this famine would come out of nowhere and just show up and you couldn't find the word of the Lord. Is that what it says? No. Read verse 11. I will send a famine. Why? Well, a better reading would be, a better translation would be, I think it was a scribal error. I don't think the King James Bible is inspired. The Lord put up with that for a long time. Among, among the fundamentalists. Okay, it supposedly started among the you know, uh, what do they call them, the liberals and things like that. But you have a lot of the old-time fundamentalists like John R. Rice and a lot of these guys that are coming out and attacking the King James Bible and putting doubts into people's mind about the King James Bible. And the Lord said, oh, you don't trust my word? Okay, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send a famine in the land. You're not going to hear this book. How many churches preach out of the King James Bible? And of those that do preach out of the King James Bible, how many of them are actually telling you the truth? There is a famine in the land. I can attest to it. There again, I get letters all the time. People say, where am I supposed to go to church? I live in this area. There's nothing in the area. I've gone to every single church. None of them preach the King James Bible. And those that do, it's so watered down and, and wishy-washy, I don't get anything out of it. You know? I was going to a Baptist church and there were there were like three families left the one Sunday and the pastor stood up and he said, they left because they said they weren't being fed the Word of God. And he's like, you don't come to church to be fed. You come to, to, to minister to other people. I thought, boy, you need to read your Bible. Seminary trained, ordained pastor of God. 
And he didn't know enough scripture to see that a pastor's job is to feed the flock. So what's going on? There's a famine in the land. You say, well, that's not true. You know, the, these new versions, you can still get things out of them. Really? Let's look at a couple of verses here very quickly. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. The NIV says, In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. King James Bible says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. What's going on there? This King James Bible is God's true word. He will direct your path. Well, what happens is when somebody uses that NIV, it'd be like somebody coming along and saying, I got this note from Brian Denlinger. It says I can go to the bank and draw out money. And I say, and the bank calls me and they say, did you write that? No. Well, then it's no good. And that's exactly what goes on with these new versions. They're down there saying, God will make your path straight today, friend. He'll straighten out all your problems. He'll make things go away. And God looks down and He says, I didn't say that. I'm not going to bless that. That's what's going on. Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Another good one. Uh, for I know the plans I have for you. This is the NIV. Declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You see these in these apostate, you know, Christian bookstores. They got them on, you know, put it on your wall. I know the plans I have towards you, or for you. What's the King James Bible say? It says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. By the way, the NIV was made predominantly by Calvinists that want you to believe that God has everything preordained and preplanned for your whole life, which is nonsense. You're given a free will to get saved, and after you're saved, whether or not you serve the Lord. Okay, God's not going to force you into, into submission like the Calvinists teach. Okay, But it says here, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Uh, where did it say anything there about plans to prosper you? It doesn't. It says thoughts of peace. Remember what we wrote, or read about earlier? We are children of light, and therefore we have peace. Nothing about prosper. But you see, the new version comes in and they say, God has plans for you, dear friend. He wants to prosper you. Who wants to be a millionaire? See? That's what they're doing. And God looks down from heaven and He says, I didn't say that. Oh, but it's right here in, in my NIV Bible. And God says, yeah, that's not my book. Right. It's fake. It's a counterfeit. I didn't say that. You say, well, why would God allow such a horrible deception to come on the church? Because that's what they want. Amen. They don't want the King James Bible. It's too strong. Let's water it down a little bit. I don't want just peace. I want prosperity. And God says, go ahead. Yeah, sure. There, Have your NIV. Yeah, print them up. Yep. Hand them out. And I won't do a thing for you people. That's why the church has no more power here in America. Churches. I think a lot of them are not part of the church. One more thing here. Philippians 4.13. I can do all, all this. This is the, the newest NIV. So it's going to sound a little bit. The 2011 NIV. They changed things even again, you know. Uh, Philippians 4.13, I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. The real Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Well, through, who's the Him? You say, well, through Christ. Where'd you get that from? You got it from the King James Bible. So you have to repair your wimpy, lying version, NIV, with the King James Bible. But there is a whole generation of young people now that are using these new versions that don't have that King James Bible reading in the back of their minds. That's right. They weren't raised with it. So they'll say, well, through him, well, I can pick anybody I want to get strength from. I can pick Muhammad. I can pick Buddha. I can pick the president. I can pick anybody. And God looks down from heaven and he says, I'm not going to bless you and I'm not going to use you. It's the way it is. Now we're going to go to Zephaniah chapter 3. You say, well, I just can't, I have a hard time believing this, uh, this whole thing of God judging and, you know, we shouldn't be judgmental, you know, they say. We're going to see about something here that's just amazing. 
Again, another scripture that most modern Christians are going to avoid. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8. A lot of people have heard about the new world order, the one world government that's coming. And they seem to think that it's something that's happening and God's up in heaven biting His fingernails going, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I didn't know that they could do this thing. That's not it. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Now that's a hard saying for a lot of people. All this one world government stuff, all these things that people are coming together and we're going to form this one world government and we're going to all that. Who's behind it? According to that verse, God is. God is going to pour out. He's gathering these people together. He's saying, you want your one world government? You want control? You want monopoly? You want to have all this stuff bring everybody together and have your totalitarian world government? Go ahead. Go right ahead. It's going to make it easier for me to destroy you. you. Say, well, that's horrible. Yeah, but there's a way out. There's a way out. You don't have to be part of that. And a lot of Christians have taken their eyes off of verses like this and they put it on the world and they think, oh, the Bilderbergers are going to get me. The Illuminati is going to get me. The CFR is going to get me. They realize that there is this conspiracy there, but they don't understand that God is the one who's putting the thing together. Because it's what the people want. That's what's going on. And God provides a way out. You don't have to go through it. Another place we got to go to. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. I'm going to show you something here. Very interesting. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 13. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against a bunch of things. One of them is principalities. Spiritual wickedness in high places. The ones that control the Illuminati, you know, the higher up fallen angels and all this other stuff that people get into. But who controls them? Let's look here. Colossians 1.13 says here, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom, who's the whom? God's dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. By the way, the NIV attacks that verse. They take out the blood, as do most versions. Verse 15, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities, or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. Jesus Christ is in charge. You say, oh no, the, the, you know, the one worlders, they're taking over. No, they're doing exactly what the Lord's telling them to do. Why? Because that's what the people want. They've rejected Jesus Christ. They've rejected the Word of God. And so God says, okay, you want to do that? You want to be evil? You want to live in sin? Then I'm going to bring this stuff upon you. You don't have to go through it. You can get out of it. You can repent. You can get out of that thing. But most people don't want it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 6. Here's another one. A lot of people, oh, the God of the Old Testament, He was so cruel. He was so mean. Yeah, well, uh, you haven't seen anything yet. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. And now ye know what withholdeth that He might be revealed in His time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only He who now letteth will let until He be taken out of the way. That's the body of Christ. Okay? When we get taken out of the way, then verse 8. And then shall that wicked... The Antichrist, there, that's what the wicked is. Uh, 
And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Who's going to miss the rapture? The people that receive not the love of the truth. The people that will not accept Jesus Christ. The people that attack God's Word. That make fun of this book. Those people receive not the love of the truth. That's the way it is. Now let's look what happens to them. Verse 11. And for this cause, because they didn't receive love of the truth, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God is going to send them strong delusion. And we are very close to that. It could be within weeks. I don't know. It could be another year or two that we have to be stuck here on this miserable planet. But the fact is, I think it's coming soon. And what the strong delusion is there. I think it's going to be a combination of a bunch of things. When the body of Christ leaves and the Antichrist is revealed, I think the Antichrist is the major strong delusion because I think when he shows up, he's going to be a perfect counterfeit for Jesus Christ. I think he's going to look like the guy that we think Jesus looked like. You know, We don't really know what Jesus looked like, but all these paintings out there, I think that that's what the Antichrist is going to look like. And when he shows up like that and he comes and he says, I am Christ, and he brings unity to the world and the television promotes him people are going to be falling down and worship him and they're going to take the mark and they're going to be damned for all of eternity no chance of getting saved and who brings it god does god sends it to them why because they receive not the love of the truth god doesn't send it on innocent people god doesn't say i'm going to send you this strong delusion that you might be damned. He doesn't say that to people that are just. He says it to people that are left here after the rapture because they were never saved. They didn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. That's who he's going to send it to. Okay. Revelation chapter 6. We're getting there. It's a big study. I, you know, There again, a lot of people, you know, give me a 10 minute sermon. You aren't going to get anything in 10 minutes. Do you get a meal in 10 minutes? Some people do. Hello, welcome to McDonald's. What can I get for you? You know, Give me a value meal. Is it going to give you any kind of health? No. A good meal takes time. Okay? In fact, you could probably say that a good meal will take you about an hour or two to get ready. A good meal. You know? So deal with it when I go over an hour <laughs> with my preaching. Okay? Okay. Uh, yeah, Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. It says here, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Who unleashes the Antichrist? The Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus Christ. And you read through the book of Revelation, it's not the Illuminati. You don't see the word Illuminati in the book of Revelation. Or Council on Foreign Relations, or the Bilderbergers, or the One Worlders, or the International Bankers. What you see is God and angels opening the seals, pouring out the vials of wrath, blowing the trumpets. God's wrath is coming down on this earth soon. Very soon. Okay? And why? Because they're evil. Oh, what a terrible thing. You can escape. The body of Christ is not left yet. You can still get out of the thing. Um, Revelation chapter 8, verse 6. Revelation chapter 8, verse 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Jump down to verse 13. We're going to skip a couple of verses here just simply for sake of time. Um, 
And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Okay? Uh, you can read those verses in your own time, but you'll see that thing of a third of this, a third of that, one third, one third, one third. What's going on there? Well, what part of the Godhead did man kill? One third. Okay? Uh, we're not going to turn there, but in, in Matthew 26, or Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, Jesus says, You know, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So God leaves, the soul leaves. Matthew 27, verse 50, it says that Jesus gave up the ghost. So the Holy Ghost leaves. Jesus died on the cross, but God and the Holy Spirit didn't. Okay? So it's one third of the Godhead that died on the cross. And therefore, God says, All right. You reject Jesus Christ, then I'm going to take out a third of you. A third of the waters. A third of the people. A third of the trees. A third of this. That's what's coming. And it's not coming upon Christians. Okay? We have accepted Jesus Christ. We're not doing anything wrong in the, in the sense of you know, what the lost world is doing. We're saved. We're redeemed. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Okay, God's wrath is coming on the lost world, not on Christians, not on the body of Christ. We don't need to be purified. I mean, don't fall for this ridiculous nonsense. Um, go down through here. Revelation chapter 9, verse 13. Actually, we'll just jump down to uh, verse 20 for sake of time. It's running a little bit late here. But you see the thing about the thirds there again. Revelation chapter 20. Now man has been put through the ringer. They've been put through this thing of the third, the third, the third. Third part of people dying. That's a lot of people. I mean, right now there's, what, seven billion people on the earth? So you're talking about two and a third billion people, essentially. You know? That's a lot of people dying. Now, at the end of that, what, would, what should be their reaction to God? At the end of being smitten like that. Look at verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and, and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders nor of their sorceries nor of their fornication nor of their thefts. You're going to have a lot of theft by the way after the rapture. <laughs> when the Christians are gone going to be a lot of nice houses out there stuff to steal you can have it <laughs> no thank you i'm not staying okay they don't repent of the evil so guess what god doesn't either they don't want to learn god says okay let's get started here again a third we did the thirds is that enough nope they didn't repent and by the way when's the last time you heard people repenting after one of the major disasters that's that's been hitting the world right now they don't a lot of times they get mad and angry at god so we're heading right into this time period i'll tell you what glad i'm leaving now in conclusion does god create evil yes he does the bible says so it's right there you can't deny it god creates evil okay why to punish the wicked. God can't say, I'm going to bless those that are doing good. I'm going to bless the righteous. I'm going to bless those that are living according to my word. And I'm also going to bless the people that are doing the opposite. God can't do that. God has to punish the wicked. And how's He going to punish them? With evil. Okay? That's the way it is. it's going to have to be. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, will God repent of this evil? God has things prepared and set for men that are sinners, that are wicked. Does God turn from that? Well, yes and no. Yes, God will turn. He'll repent of evil that He had to do for to a man if that man gets saved. God will repent of the evil. 
right now, if you're listening to this message and you don't want to go through what's happening in the book of Revelation, you can get saved and God will say, okay, I'm going to take you up before this time comes. So you have that. But what about somebody who says no? What about somebody that says, I don't want anything to do with the Bible. I don't want salvation, whatever else. Somebody that rejects Jesus Christ, they say, I don't want to hear about that. Don't talk to me. Is God going to repent of the evil that He has set for them? No. It's going to come. And it's coming soon, by the way. There's a lot of people that laugh and mock, you know, oh, you know, where's your God? He can't do this and He can't do that. It's coming. And we're already seeing it. You know, it's it's weird. I mean, I, I talked to a, a buddy of mine and we talked to the one week and he's like you know this time times are getting really strange he's like since we talked the last time there's been an earthquake and a hurricane <laughs> you know <laughs> two major events and we don't get hit with hurricanes and earthquakes here on the east coast pennsylvania doesn't get hit that bad but we're getting hit it's happening all over the place now if the bible's true it's going to increase and it's going to get worse and worse if the Bible's false, if the Bible's not true, then things are going to get better. I don't think that's going to happen. Okay? So, in the thing I want to say here at the end is God can create evil. He can do some very, very bad things to people. And you're going to see that happening if you're not saved. You say, I want proof that God's real. There's going to be more proof these atheists that are out there that mock the Bible right now, if you're a Christian, you don't have to convert them. You don't have to answer all their stupid questions, all their supposed contradictions in the Bible, and whatever else. Just say, we've been given a more sure word of prophecy. This King James Bible is coming true right now, and it's going to come more and more true. And they're going to laugh at you. Most atheists are going to laugh at you. Most evolutionists are going to laugh at you. Most Catholics, most whatever, they're going to laugh at you. Let them laugh. They won't be laughing soon. Yeah, and a lot of professing Christians, exactly. They aren't going to be laughing soon. This King James Bible is going to come true. It already is. And if you're a child of light, you know that. But if you're a child of darkness, which you probably didn't make it this far if you are in the sermon, <laughs> but if you are and you've heard it this far and you still reject Jesus Christ and you still reject the Bible you're going to see times that are coming where God pours out such wrath and such evil on this planet, it's never going to be, it's never been as bad as it's going to be. Okay? Does God create evil? Yes. Can God repent of that evil? Can He turn from that evil? Yeah. But I'm telling you right now, the world is set right now. The stage is being set for the worst outpouring of God's wrath ever in human history, ever since the beginning of the world. You think things back in the Old Testament were bad? Haven't seen anything yet. Okay? Get saved. I'm telling you, man, there is not much time left. I mean, we could be looking at a very, very short time. You know, I've been hearing some stuff, some different guys predicting some things, the Feast of Trumpets and all this other stuff. I don't know. I don't know. I don't set dates except for the one that I heard the one time which I thought was good and that's perhaps today. You know. When do you think Jesus is coming back? Perhaps today? Maybe tomorrow? I don't know. But as a child of light, I can see prophecy being fulfilled. I can see it coming. And it's coming soon. And I am glad that I'm not going to be here. So that's going to be it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, 
www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.